when we talk about living things, there's a huge amount of diversity, right? There are all different sorts of living things. There are humans, there are plants, there are bacteria, all sorts of other living things when you look around. And so this means if we're gonna try and study life, it's important to be able to sort of classify things, group things into um, groupings that make sense. So we like to look at characteristics of living things and then group all of the living things together that have that same characteristic. So this is a branch of biology that's called taxonomy that deals with the naming and classifying of living things. And what we have up here on the screen is sort of the classification groupings from broadest down to very specific. Uh, so the broadest grouping of living things is the domain. What domain does a particular living thing belong to? There are three different domains of life. We're gonna go ahead and um, put them down here on the slide. And what is it that the domain is really describing? It's describing whether there's a nucleus present in the cells of these living things. And we're gonna get all into detail in cells coming up shortly, not in this chapter, but in an upcoming chapter. Um, so for right now, bear with me, the nucleus of a cell is just the place where the DNA is kept. Some cells have a nucleus, it's like a little shell around the DNA. Others do not have a nucleus, the DNA just kind of floats freely. So anyway, looking at these domains of life, there are three different domains of life. We have bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Okay, so the thing that distinguishes these from each other is that um, these two domains, the bacteria and the archaea, these cells do not have a nucleus around their DNA. The DNA just kind of floats freely in the cell. Um, organisms that belong in these domains, they are unicellular. Their whole bodies are made up of just one single cell. So this basically, this includes the bacteria and some very special bacteria that live in extreme conditions. This third domain of life, the eukarya, this is where we're gonna be this semester. Um, humans are in this domain, eukarya. And eukarya, if we look at the cells of these organisms, um, they do have a nucleus. They have this special sort of shell, protective shell around the DNA. All right, so once we divvy things up at this level, we can take it even further. Let's look at even more specifics. Let's focus in on, on the eukarya and see if we can make some distinctions within this category. All right, so next up, what we might do is consider for different organisms, are they unicellular or are they multicellular? Okay, if they're unicellular and they're eukaryotic, then they're gonna fall in the protista, most likely. The protists involve um, single-celled organisms that are eukaryotic. They have that shell around their nucleus, around their DNA. Um, if they are instead multicellular, then they're going to, going to fit in one of these three kingdoms. Okay, so domain is the broadest classification scheme, and then kingdom is like the next level down that's a little bit more specific. Um, there are four kingdoms within the domain eukarya. All right, so then um, if you're curious, what's the difference between these different kingdoms? It has to do with the type of metabolism that these living things make use of. So um, looking at these three, okay, the plants, all plants are capable of photosynthesis. They get their energy from the sun via photosynthesis. The fungi, these are organisms that um, are they're sort of like decomposers. They break down organic molecules, which is a really important job. If they didn't do that, there'd be a whole lot of waste that would just build up and it'd be really gross outside. Uh, but the fungi do a really good job of cleaning up. They decompose and recycle materials back into the environment. And then finally, the animals, animalia, in this kingdom, um, what's true of animals? How do they obtain their... their uh, their energy, their food source. How do they get their food? They have to eat things, right? We have to ingest our food. The word for that is being heterotrophic. Um, so we're not able to directly get our energy from the sun. We can't photosynthesize. Instead, we have to ingest our food. So that's kind of the difference. It's the type of metabolism that these three um, make use of. All right, now let's see here. 
focusing in on humans. All right, so we talked about we talked about the distinction unicellular versus multicellular. If we're looking at humans specifically, right, we're multicellular. So we're going to fit in one of these three categories. Where do we fit? We fit in the kingdom Animalia. So with all the other animals is where humans are grouped into this classification scheme. And just to really list out specifically for humans, what is the domain, the kingdom, the phylum, the class, the order, the family, the genus, and the species? Let's just list them all out. Let's be really explicit here. Okay, so humans belong to the domain Eukarya. They belong to the kingdom Animalia. And then if we get more specific beyond that, we could talk about what phylum are they in. They're in the phylum Chordata. What does that mean? This is just referring to animals that have a neural cord, right, down the, down the spinal column. We have a um, a neural cord. Okay, next up, humans belong in the grouping of mammals, right? We are mammals. We have hair and we have mammary glands for um, producing milk for babies. So that's that's defining the class that we belong to. The order that we belong to is in the primates. Um, the primates include humans, but it also includes things like lemurs, monkeys, and apes as well. Getting more specific, what family do humans belong to? We belong to the family Hominidae. And this is just generally re referring to humans, um, past and present. And then genus would be Homo, a species is sapiens. So finally, this is where it gets kind of familiar. Homo sapiens, that's the genus and species name for humans. And genus and species, this is the, um, this is commonly how we can refer very specifically to a living thing, right? What genus and species do they belong to? It's um, standard just to write these words in italics and also capitalize that first letter just on genus, not on species. So maybe that's a little bit of review for you, or maybe it's not, maybe it's new to you. Anyway, this is all dealing with taxonomy, the naming and classifying of living things. Um, it's kind of a specialized branch of biology. The purpose for us right now is just kind of to set the stage and get the big picture. Where do humans belong in the bigger scheme of biology? Here they are. <laughs> okay, so having done all of that, having looked at all of that, it kind of starts to feel like oh, we're just grouping humans in with all of other living things. What is it that really sets humans apart? There are a lot of things that set humans apart from other living things. We're going to start just with sort of the biological look. What is it that, that makes humans different from other living things? Of course, we know there's more beyond this list too, right? You all know the people in your life are very individual. Um, there's something different about people than other living things. But again, we're just sort of defining based on um, physical characteristics and things that we can observe and, and really... Um, have some data to back up. Okay, so how are humans different? For one thing, we're actually the only mammal that we know of that prefers to stand on two feet and walk upright. Okay, so other animals, other mammals, um, they go on all fours generally. Humans are different in that way. We also have differences in our hands. Our hands are designed differently than other animals, even if we compare like to apes or monkeys. Um, that there are differences in our hands. We have opposable thumbs and we tend to have really well-developed muscles that allow us to use that opposable thumb very precisely. And I'm gonna put up a picture here. This is from our textbook, just kind of comparing a human hand with a non-human hand, right, from an ape or a monkey. And if you look at this, so sure, the monkey does have an opposable thumb, but the way that that thumb gets used is a little bit differently. For humans, we tend to use our fingertips. We have a lot of um, a lot of nerve endings there that give us very fine feeling and very fine control of things. With apes, they don't really use their fingertips. They tend to hold. Uh, their, so right here, it's using an opposable thumb, but holding on to this sort of on the side of the finger instead of the fingertip. So that's one difference. Just that really precise, fine control that humans have over things. This allows us to do very detailed work. Most animals can't do that. We also have a relatively large brain compared to our body size. And going along with that, there are large regions of our brain, or there are very specific regions of the brain, especially on the left side, that are devoted to language, being able to make use of language. 
So do other living things communicate? Sure, definitely, right? Birds sing, they communicate with each other, but they don't have the level of complex language, at least as far as we know, they don't have this level of complex language um, that humans do. So humans are able to, to vocalize, we're able to, to speak different words, have different languages even. Um, and then we also have this whole set of like signs and symbols and gestures that we can associate with, with language, right? So there's a sort of a visual aspect to language as well. Um, and then there's also this ability to write things down, written language. That's something that's pretty unique to humans. Again, as far as we know, <laughs> I have to be careful how I, how I say this. Um, anyway, this complexity of language development is really, really unique to humans. We don't see that in other animals. So when we study human biology, there are actually a lot of different levels that we could do that at. We could look very microscopically, we could look at how atoms are connected together, um, what sorts of molecules are present, or we could look very broadly, we could look at how do humans interact with the rest of the living world, right? Those are two di very different types of studies of human biology, um, and it turns out there are, there are many different levels like this. If we just follow this figure, um, starting at the microscopic level, okay, how do molecules come together to form cells? How do cells work together to give us tissues and organs? And then how do organs work together in organ systems? You can go on and on, up and up, right? All the way until you're looking at the whole biosphere, all the living things on Earth. Um, for us, what we're going to do, we're going to start kind of small and work our way up. We will be spending a lot of time at the organ system level this semester, and this is going to be super relevant for any sort of allied health career or, or other careers too, um, but the, the organ system level, this is kind of where we're going to be taking our studies to in this class, just to kind of give you some perspective there.